Well, thank you for joining me for the next 30 minutes or so. We're going to jump into our very last installment of our teaching series that we have called Rewrite, looking at, at how Jesus rewrote the lives of the disciples that he called to follow him. But before we jump into our last installment, just again, as I always do, a bit of a reminder, jump on our website, www.myfaithchurch.org. Browse around that thing. We're in the middle of trying to redo our website a bit, uh, but there's still some resources that you can take advantage of. Instructions of how to download your own personal account of Right Now Media, sort of a Netflix type of Bible study, or all kinds of Bible studies that you can choose to 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 use and feed yourself throughout the week, as well of as well as in some some instructions of how to download the U Version Bible app comes in really handy. Uh, if you click the event tab, you can find Faith Church there. All of our teaching notes are usually on there. Click the donate button if you feel so led. We thank you for your contribution or text a contribution to My Faith Church 73256. Well, we are in our last installment of a teaching series that we've titled Rewrite. Um, we've been on this for just a little, a little bit over a month, and we're looking at how Jesus as he called his disciples to follow him, it wasn't a nine to five calling. It was a lifestyle. Um, it wasn't something that Jesus called his disciples and said, hey, we're going to uh, sit you down at nine o'clock and we're going to go to five o'clock and then you can go home and uh, you can just do whatever you want with the, with the, rest, of your, uh, the rest of your time. Uh, Jesus called his disciples into a lifestyle, rewrote the rhythms and the patterns of, of their life as they saw how he functioned uh, in this world. Uh, it wasn't so much that everything was just taught in sort of an academic setting. There certainly was times when when Jesus taught and they listened and they sat and, and uh, they were instructed. But also uh, spirituality, the, the lifestyle of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, it was caught. Uh, the rhythms and the patterns of this apprentice type of lifestyle that he called them into uh, is just all throughout the scripture, all throughout the Gospels. And so over the last uh, six weeks or so, or five weeks, uh, we've been looking at some of these patterns, some of these rhythms of Jesus and how he, by example, shown his disciples how they ought to live, rewrote how they ought to live their lives. Uh, and there's been a phrase that we've been repeating uh, throughout this teaching series that in order to catch the lessons that Jesus desires to teach, you need to adopt the lifestyle that Jesus lived, the patterns, the rhythms, the, uh, the, the, the way that he functioned in this world. It wasn't just what he said, uh, but it was how he lived. And the disciples caught that. And so we've been walking through just a number of those examples, and I just want to kind of give a brief review before we launch into what I believe the Lord has for us today, this final installment of this teaching series. Where have we been, you know, for the last month or so? Well, right off the bat, as Jesus called his disciples, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This idea of being with Jesus and then from the being with him, the following part, then comes the doing. Uh, in fact, it's a great phrase. It's 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 difficult to translate um, actually from from the Greek. Follow me, and I will make you in the process of following me, fishers of men. Yes, there is the do part of the ministry, but there's also the being with part. And from the being with Jesus, then comes from out of that the doing. And so, right off the bat, we looked at this story of two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary chose what was better. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him, being with him as well as the disciples were. Martha, unfortunately, perhaps because there was something going on in her life, did not choose to be in that place of intimacy, sitting at the feet of Jesus, being with him. Instead, she jumped to the doing and she was in the kitchen preparing food for Jesus and, and his disciples, which was so important, obviously, but not as, as important as just sitting at the feet of Jesus. And because she skipped that part, her heart and her attitude was poor. And so she comes out of the kitchen and she's frustrated. And, and she says in public, in front of Jesus and in front of her sister, Jesus, tell my sister to help me. You know, don't you see what's going on here? And it just revealed there was something in Martha's heart. And Jesus responds to her, I believe, very gently. He says, Martha, you are distracted by so many things. Mary has chosen what is better. And that's what is what occurs when we jump just to the doing part and not 
the being part with Jesus. We can busy ourselves with the distractions, even of ministry. And when we do that without being with him, then it turns a little cancerous. It turns a little caustic in our hearts. And even though we may doing the right things, we're not doing it with the right the right spirit. And so right off the bat, Jesus is not just using his disciples for what he desires to use them for and then throwing them away. He cares for their soul. If he didn't care for their soul, he would just say, you need to do the ministry and not be with me. But he says, be with me, follow me, and I will make you in the process of you being with me in this relationship. I will make you fishers of men. You will do as a result of you being. Jesus also went and gave an incredible example his, to his disciples about taking time and being in a solitary place and nurturing his own relationship with his heavenly father. The disciples picked this up, even when the demands of ministry started to pick up and the crowds started gaining larger and larger crowds and more and more people and the demands of ministry were pressing in on Jesus. Jesus never neglected that important time of taking time out and going to a solitary place and spending time with his, with his heavenly father. He understood that is where the connection is. That is where the power is. And this was an incredible example that his disciples needed to pick up as Jesus was on this earth in terms with his disciples for just a very short amount of time, just three years. And Jesus, with this incredible charge that he was giving his disciples to carry that ministry of hope and healing and reconciliation and forgiveness that is only possible through belief in Jesus, right? This reconciliation with our creator father. He did not want them to neglect that time of being with their heavenly father because that is where the power was. And that's why whenever there was something big about to happen, Jesus tends to slip away and he goes to this solitary place and he spends time with his heavenly father. And then after he spends this spiritual energy, he would often go to a solitary place again, just to, to, to recharge his batteries and to, and to reconnect. His disciples picked this up. Jesus also displayed a uh, a different attitude toward the Sabbath day and, and fasting than the, the, religious, the religious leaders did. And there was a purpose there. And Jesus really has this incredible commentary on the Sabbath. He says that you feel that the man is made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is made for the man. And so he, give the, he gives his disciples this understanding of rhythms and, and rest. Um, this restlessness of the human heart that Jesus says you must deal with that obviously with a Sabbath day rest, centering yourself on what is true and what is right. This is a day that is for you. It's not a day that you are for, right? And so we looked at that as well. We looked as well as, as um, also Jesus's view of the scripture. We looked at this last week, if you were able to join us either by video or, or in person, that the people that knew the scriptures the best here on this earth, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, for whatever reason, right? They seemed to be the ones that were just, really in conflict with Jesus. And the reason why is because they were not approaching the scripture with humility. They were approaching it with this idea that they could fulfill the law. And it was an arrogance and it was a, a selfishness and a self-righteousness that resulted from that. Uh, and yet they missed the entire point of the scripture. The law was meant to reveal our inability to follow it and, and our need for a savior. And for whatever reason, because of their pride and their arrogance, they were taking the scripture. And even though they knew it, the letter of the law, they missed the spirit of the law. And Jesus always would draw his disciples back to the ministry of the word and the law. The law is perfect, but yet the law cannot save anybody. The law points to our need for a savior. So we have been all over the gospels over the past month and five weeks or so. And we want to look at uh, a scripture here this morning. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading here in just a moment in verse 21 uh, and go to, I believe it's about verse 44 or so. It's a familiar passage of scripture where, where Jesus is interacting with two very different and yet similar uh, people. Uh, the scripture that I'm referring to is when Jesus is amongst the crowd and he is traveling to a particular place, but he has an interruption in his life. And because of this interruption, a guy by the name of Jairus, a synagogue leader, an important person, uh, is compelled because his daughter is sick. 
and she is dying and at great risk to his own reputation because, you know, Jesus and the religious leaders often, they, they butted, head, butted heads. He, he goes, as any father who loves his daughter would, and ask Jesus to come to his home and heal his daughter, his 12-year-old daughter. And Jesus complies. I mean, he desires to, to be and meet Jairus and his 12-year-old daughter where they are at. And he's going to go to their house. But along the way, there is this woman. And she's not, uh, she doesn't have a name, but she has a 12-year issue uh, uh, of a flow of blood. We don't know all the details, but for 12 years, she had this continual flow of blood, which, have made, which would have made her ceremonially unclean. And she shouldn't even have been in a crowd. And yet amongst this crowd, she feels that if she can just touch the hem of Jesus's garment, that she would be healed. And at great risk to her, and um, she actually is in this crowd and she touches the hem of Jesus's garment and Jesus stops and he says, power has gone out from me. And he, he exposes her, not to embarrass her, but to, but to really to highlight her, her faith. Uh, and he commends her and he calls her daughter and, and she is healed. And then after that, he gets to the house of Jairus and the, the, the little girl is dead. And he goes and he sends the people away, the mourners who were there and the crowd and the hustle and the bustle. And he goes into her room and he raises her from the dead. Two very different people, two very different scenarios, but all with this incredible desperateness. Now, what does this story or these two accounts have to do with this rhythm and this pattern of the life of Jesus that we see throughout the Gospels that he is displaying to his disciples. I don't know if you've ever seen um, any of the episodes of The Chosen. I would highly recommend um, you looking at that and maybe if you have some free time, I think they do a great job um, of really trying to get to the heart of what it might have been like to be a disciple of, of Jesus. It's obviously, it's not perfect. It's a, it's a man-made thing. It's, they take some freedoms and some license, but overall, it's, a, it's, very, it's very well done. One of the things I think they do a very good job of is expressing the disciples' um, hurried up attitude. Jesus never went fast enough for them. They were always 10 steps ahead of Jesus, wanting him to promote his ministry and to establish his position. And yet Jesus just seemed to walk at his own pace. There, there's a great book um, called The Relentless, I have it actually right here, The Relentless Elimination of Hurry. And it talks about how Jesus just walked, and I love this phrase, Jesus walked at the pace of grace. He was never in a hurry. He knew where he was going, but along the way, he allowed himself to walk at a different pace, at the pace of grace. And these two people that we just talked about here, and I'm going to read about in just a moment, if Jesus had not walked at his own pace, the pace of grace, he might have seen them as interruptions. He might have seen them as people to, that were just not that quite important. But because he walked at a pace of grace, he saw them where they were, and he also was able to interact with them exactly what they needed. And so what we're going to do over the next, you know, time that we have remaining, the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to look at this pace of grace that Jesus walked and how he was able to see these two individuals or these two situations, these, these two scenarios differently. And how, because he walked at that pace of grace, he knew exactly what to do to intercede for them. You know, as I look over the scripture, some of the biggest blunders, some of the biggest mistakes that I see people, especially in the Old Testament make, they got into a hurry. They did not walk at a pace that the Lord desired them to walk at, the pace of grace. You look at Abraham, this promise that he received that uh, he would be the father of a, of a great nation, and yet he wasn't patient. And he took Hagar, the maidservant of his wife, Sarah, and he had a child with her and Ishmael. And we're still paying the price with that kind of hurried, unfortunate mistake. 
We look at Moses' life at the age of 40. He made the right decision to um, sort of reject that Egyptian lifestyle and identify with his own people. And yet he committed murder. I think he did that because he thought it might have solidified his position amongst the Israelites. And yet they rejected him because he just wasn't long enough in the tooth yet, right? Who are you, you privileged guy who was raised in the house of Pharaoh? And he just was in a hurried state and he did something that he knew he shouldn't have done. Um, and it got in his, it cost him 40 years uh, in Midian in the, in the desert. We look at the very first king of Israel, a guy by the name of Saul. And uh, he got into a hurried state and got himself into a situation where he shouldn't have been, where he was lining up against the Philistine army. He is with his own army, the Israelites. And instead of waiting for Samuel to come and blessing the troops, he puts on the priestly garments and does that because he just wasn't patient. He was in a hurry and he was trying to save face. And that cost him the kingship. That was when God said, I, I regret ever making Saul king. And I'm looking for a king now that has the right heart, a man after my own heart, David. And I could give you example after example of people who just got into a hurry, who were not walking at the pace of grace. And so as Jesus was walking along this earth, I believe he made sure that he was walking at his own pace, even though I believe the disciples pressured him always to go a little faster, to establish himself a little more, to, to make sure that, that he was, uh, uh, you know, being in the position that he ought to be at. And I think the disciples were often frustrated at the pace in which Jesus walked, but yet Jesus walked at the perfect pace. And so I hope that as we kind of read this, that we see people the way that Jesus sees people. And then also we interact with the way that Jesus interacts with people. And all that comes about when we walk at his pace. And so I'm just going to read the passage of scripture here. If you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 20, 21. Uh, this passage of scripture or this account is also in the gospel of Mark. It's also in the gospel of Matthew. And these Two accounts, Jairus' daughter and the woman with the 12-year issue of blood, they are always told in connection with one another. You cannot separate those. And there's a purpose and there's a reason for this because God sees them both the same, even though they're very different people. So I'll just go ahead and I'll start reading. We'll make some observations, right? So starting in verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat, to the other side of the lake. A large crowd gather, or gathered around him while he was by the lake. This is the Sea of Galilee. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus, and so he was an important man, he had an important position, came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him. So we see that Jesus is seeing Jairus, not because he's a synagogue leader, a person of importance, but he's seeing him as a desperate father, a man who loved his father so, or, or loved his daughter so much that he was willing to risk his reputation, perhaps even his position as a synagogue leader to go to this controversial leader by the name of Jesus because he knew out of desperation that Jesus was his only hope. And Jesus sees this. And then starting in verse 24, Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. And so we have a 12-year-old daughter from, Jar from Jairus and now we have a woman who has a 12-year issue, this flow of blood. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now, just like Jairus, I'm sure Jairus had went to every single doctor, every single healer, every single advisor that he could possibly think of before he came to Jesus. 
And out of desperation, he comes to Jesus, sort of as the last result, uh, result, uh, resort. And yet we see the woman here with this 12-year issue of flow of blood. She's desperate in her own way, isn't she? She has spent everything that she has going to doctors and healers. And instead of getting better, the scripture says she grew worse. And out of desperation, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd at great risk to her. Because according to the law, she was ceremonially unclean. She shouldn't even have been in the crowd. According to the Mosaic law, she should have been outside of the camp. According to Mosaic law, she could have been, if she was married, divorced by her, her husband, could have legally divorced her by this issue. We also know that, that she could have been disowned by her father because of this particular issue. So in many ways, for 12 years, not only is she dealing with this issue of this flow of blood that would have made her weak, it would have made her ceremonially unclean, but also her relationships have been hurt. She's, been, she's isolated and she's desperate. She has tried everything that she possibly could do in order to get better. And so we continue to read. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. This cloak that she's touching, many scholars believe that this was probably the, the, the tallit or the, the prayer shawl of Jesus where um, rabbis would use this. They would have this head covering and they would put it over their heads and they had tassels on the four corners. It was a, it was a symbol of the, the tabernacle in the Old Testament where God would meet with his people. And so your own personal little tent of, of meeting, if you were a rabbi, you would place this over your head and you would touch the tassels, the tie downs of the, of the tabernacle and meet with the Lord. It was thought to have healing power as you interceded with, your, with the heavenly father. So perhaps she was thinking that if she could just touch this prayer shawl, this corner of, of Jesus's robe, that because he was in such connection with his father that perhaps some of that healing power would flow out with, for, from that. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffer, suffering. Something with inside of her said, I'm free from this. Jesus saw both of these individuals, even though they were very different. One had a very prestigious position within the synagogue. He was a leader, and yet he was desperate because his little girl was sick. And on the other hand, we have a woman who couldn't have even gone into the synagogue because of her issue that she had been suffering with for, for 12 years. Like Jairus, she had come to the end of her rope. And she had spent all that she had on these doctors. She was desperate. And even though they come from di very different positions, very different social status, Jesus sees them as desperate people. And the reason why he was able to see them, yet they were different, but yet they were the same. They had the same desperation, was because Jesus walked at the pace of grace. It allowed him to see people beyond what was just upon the surface and what was going on behind the issues. A few years ago, we have, and we do this about every year at Faith Church, we rent out the park pool in July. And um, it's at six o'clock when the pool shuts down and we get it from six to eight. And it's a free event for anybody who wants to come. And we have people bring in food and uh, we just kind of have a good time and watch kids swim and go down the slides and just uh, connect with one another. But um, a few years ago, it was, there was a storm that was brewing and it came up right about the time where the park was going to shut or the pool was going to shut down and we were going to go in. And it was quite a, quite a rainstorm with, with lightning and, and wind and, and we had all the food there and we were ready to go in. And yet the, the people who were in charge of the pool, they come out and they say, we're going to have to cancel, you know, this event tonight. And, and, uh, I know what that meant. Uh, those, those dates get, um, as soon as they open up to rent, those dates get taken. So there was no way that we were going to possibly be able to, to reschedule that year. And so I knew that we were going to have to cancel uh, that event for, for this particular year. And so I kind of made the announcement to all the people who were gathered around uh, in the parking lot that unfortunately, because of the weather and the storm and the lightning, um, that we were just going to have to cancel. And um, sorry about the, the inconvenience. 
there was a, a lady that was there who had been invited by uh, by somebody uh, from the church. I, I had never met her before, um, but uh, uh, she was kind of upset that we had, we had and it was, wasn't our fault, it was the weather, right? And it wasn't the, the, the people who were in charge of the pool, it wasn't their fault either. But she was upset that she had driven all the way from, from Greenwood to, to Martinsville and wasted all that gas. And, and uh, she said, actually, I heard her from a distance saying to her friend that had invited her, I, I wanna speak to the person who's in charge. Um, and I heard somebody say this for the first time. I had never heard this phrase before. Um, somebody called her a Karen, right? I, and I, I know what that means now, but that was the first time I ever heard that, that phrase associated with a, a particular person. And, and so obviously, you know, she eventually, she got to me and, and she said, I just don't think this is fair. You know, I drove all the way from, from Greenwood and she made a comment. She said, who is going to compensate me for my gas? And what I wanted to say to her was this. I wanted to say, this is a free event. Um, you were gonna come and you were gonna get in free with your kids and you were gonna eat the free food and, and you know, we can't control the weather. How in the world can you ask us to compensate you for your gas, right? And I, I didn't end up saying that, obviously. I ended up saying, well, I'm sorry. I can't do that, obviously, but uh, I'll let you know if we are able to reschedule this year, knowing full well that we weren't gonna be able to do it. And so I, I sort of just walked away um, and she continued to be sort of irate and, and mad and, and uh, she was talking to her friend. And about 15 minutes later, as we're packing up all this kind of stuff, I see someone from the church in the parking lot talking to her. And I find out later that uh, this person who was talking to her comes and he shares with her, with me, her situation that she was going through a, a marriage crisis and her husband did not want her to come and spend that gas money. And he was in support of what she was doing with the kids and she had health issues and they had financial issues and they, she had a lot of stuff going on, obviously that I didn't know. There's always at times, isn't this true? The person's behavior toward you. Oftentimes we have to think what has prompted that behavior? And we see that Jesus, because he walked at the pace of grace, just like the person who was in the parking lot talking, talking to that lady who was irate, he walked at the pace of grace and listened to her because he knew there was something behind some of the ridiculous statements that she was making. And he was able to listen to her story and he was able to talk to her. And I believe he was even actually able to, to pray with her because he walked and he saw her differently than I did at that moment. And I believe that's what Jesus was telling his disciples by showing this by example when it came to, to Jairus, who had this 12-year-old daughter who was terribly sick, who had reached the end of his rope, as well as this woman with this 12-year issue of blood. She had spent everything that she had. She has reached the end of her rope as well. And even though here's Jairus, a great risk to his reputation and position, and here's this woman, the 12-year issue of the flow of blood, at great risk to her own personal safety because she's a part of a crowd now that she shouldn't have been in. All of that stuff sort of melted away because Jesus saw them in their desperation. I just pray the Lord that he will allow me to walk at that pace of grace, to see people beyond what their surface stuff at times presents to me and see the stuff beyond, be, behind it because that's what it means to walk in the pace of grace. And when we do that, then we are able, I believe, from the Lord to receive. What are we to do? How do we to, are to, to interact with people as we see them the way that Jesus sees them? Well, let me continue to read and we'll see how Jesus reacted to this woman and also to Jairus. Well, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. Verse 30, at once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you. I mean, this is obvious, there's a big crowd, right? Um, and Jesus answered, and, and yet, how can you ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembled with fear, told him the whole truth, it was me who touched you. And Jesus knew how to interact with her. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Jesus did not call her out to embarrass her. Jesus called her out 
to amplify her. For 12 years, people had dismissed her, who wanted her to be away. She was, she was there in her shame. She was there in her suffering alone. And Jesus was not about to let her to go unnoticed. And so in public and full view of the crowd, he wanted to highlight her faith, that her faith had made her well and that she had done a good thing in her desperateness. Jesus actually calls her daughter here. It's the only time in the Gospels that is recorded that he calls someone daughter. And perhaps that's why, because according to the law, she could have been disowned by her own father. And Jesus is not going to allow her to slip away just out of sight and out of mind without calling her daughter in front of the entire crowd. This woman who has suffered for 12 years. It was a public event and he made sure that she was publicly recognized. We see that it is different, though, when it comes to Jairus and the situation that was going on here. While Jesus was still speaking, this is verse 35, some people came from the house of Jairus and the synagogue leaders, as your daughter is dead, they said, why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not allow anyone to follow him. He's now kind of saying, crowd, this is not for you. Except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion, another crowd, with people crying and wailing loudly. And he went and he said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead by sleep. And they all laughed at him after he put them all out. And so this is going to be a private moment. The woman with the 12-year issue, that was a public moment. But now here with Jairus and his daughter, he puts the crowd away, only allows a few people in the room. Why? Well, I think there's reasons for that. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with them and went to where the child was, took her by the hand. See, the 12-year-old he takes by the hand. The woman with the 12-year issue, she touches him. There's a, it's, the same t it's a different touch, but th there's a touch. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha kuam, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished, and he gave strict orders this time not to let anyone know about this, a private moment with a father and a mother, Jesus and three disciples, and told them to give her something to eat. We don't know all the reasons why Jesus said in this particular moment to keep this private. Maybe it was because the crowd he saw was fickle. Maybe he saw that the mourners that were there it wasn't appropriate for them to see this miracle because they were not believing in who he was and what he could do. We don't know all the reasons why. Jesus kept this particular miracle private, but he had a reason. And the reason why is because he saw Jairus exactly who he was beyond just his desperate, beyond just why he came, but also the desperation. And he said, this is a moment just for you and your wife and your little girl and a few of my disciples. And because he saw him and he walked at a pace of grace, he knew how to interact with him in the appropriate way, in the same way, but a different way, that he saw the woman with the 12-year issue of blood. He interacted in the right, the exact right way that he should have. That was a public event. Jairus' daughter, that was a private event. And when you walk at the pace of grace, you see people the way that Jesus sees people. And you also will interact with people the way that Jesus would. Well, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you strength until we meet again. God bless.